George Leo de Saint M. Watson, The Story of Napoleon's Death Mask, taken from the original documents, London, John Lane, 1915. Who threw the death mask of Napoleon Bonaparte? Was it Francis Burton, the surgeon of the 66th Foot Regiment and uncle of Sir Richard Francis, who searched for plaster by flashlight to mix plaster of Paris mold? Or Francois Carlo Antimarecki, the personal physician of the fallen emperor on the South Atlantic island of St. Helena, whose rude character led his patient to be considered an ignorant and unreliable person. And could it be true that Mrs. Bertrand, companion to the deposed dying king, bundled up the matrix, barely dry, and mashed her ears by crushing her snails into the pit? In the 1820s, Parisian elites loyal to Napoleon made quasi-religious pilgrimages to see the many versions of these imperial relics. The face of a man variously mentioned as commander of La Grande Army, Emperor of Elba, the Corsican fiend, the modern Hannibal, or simply as Bonnie. Similar to Napoleon, the death mask inherited the complexities of its subject matter. George Leo de Saint M. Watson examines the story of Napoleon's death mask, 1915, in scholarship surrounding the creator of the cast and finds an atmosphere charged with invention, slander, insinuation, scandal, bad blood, espionage, etc., that even the powerful inquirer is gradually and unconsciously frustrated. The investigation, infested with many germs and full of pulp, navigates, in the words of its author, between hot sword manipulation of controversy and cold research work. But both the sword and the trees are akin to a club. Regarding Antomarchy's suspicious and late assertion, apparently timed with Burton's death, that he was himself the only creator, Watson compares the admission to how one might think of a middle-aged man in a clever bra worn in adolescence and brought from a torso of cobweb to see if it still fits. Regarding a questionable wax version of the cast, Watson believes there is nothing more hideous and preposterous in Napoleon's iconography, an image derided of being as human as Melpomene, the mask of tragedy. The only solution is drunkenness on the part of its owner, Captain Weinberger of the Bavarian Army. There is no doubt that the beast was shaped into wax one night by a young, salted and chopped fox. This would explain why she invoked the simple-shaped quadruple pot of the Munich beer cellar, without the handle, was Q. Why the controversy? Aside from the mystery of the origin story, the death mask shows few signs of illness on a man who, supposedly, died of stomach cancer at the age of 51. And it lacked the attic features, the dreary Roman allure, and the rock spongy stare that crystallized invariably in Napoleon's portrait as he climbed the famous Alpine peaks. Complicated by the statesman's belief that it is not the subtlety of features, a wart on the nose that gives a resemblance. But the character of great men that dictates what to draw, the inconsistency in the death mask alarmed 19th century physiognomy. An ancient practice, apex funeral casting is linked to the emergence of modern celebrity culture across the watershed in the 18th and 19th centuries, wrote Dr. Graham Burnett, as well as a general interest in physiognomy and attempt to distinguish. She faced her Waterloo funeral casting process shortly after Napoleon's death. With the spread of photography and cinema, celluloid film has become the new indicator of reality. And it's easier to take a shot than to rub the body with pureed oil and other junk. But beliefs about Napoleon's relics persist, what Watson calls the mysteries of those most regenerated organs, which were uprooted during an autopsy and smuggled into Corsica, for better or worse, Watson left behind neither a mask nor much of a resume. Death Mask of Napoleon During the time of Napoleon Bonaparte, it was customary to cast a death mask of a great leader who had recently died. One, two, a mixture of wax or plaster was carefully placed over Napoleon's face and removed after the form had hardened. 
From this impression, subsequent copies were cast. Much mystery and controversy surrounds the origins and whereabouts of the most original cast molds. There are only four genuine bronze death masks known to exist. Napoleon's original death mask was created on May 7, 1821, one, a day and a half after the former emperor died on the island of St. Helena at age 51. One, surrounding his deathbed were doctors from France and the United Kingdom. Some historical accounts contend that Dr. Francois Carlo Antomarchi, one of several doctors who encircled Napoleon's deathbed, cast the original parent mold, which would later be used to reproduce bronze and additional plaster copies. Other records, however, indicate that Dr. Francis Burton, a surgeon attached to the British Army's 66th Regiment at St. Helena, Press. Yet another contention regarding the origins of the death mask and its copies is that Madame Bertrand, Napoleon's attendant on St. Helena, allegedly stole part of the original cast, leaving Burton with only the ears and back of the head. The British doctor subsequently sued Bertrand to retrieve the cast, but failed to do so in court. A year later, Madame Bertrand gave Antomarchy a copy of the mask, from which he had several copies made. One of those he sent to Lord Burgersh, the British envoy, representative, in Florence, asking him to pass it to the famous sculptor, Antonio Canova. Unfortunately Canova died before he had time to use the mask and instead the piece remained with Burgersh. The National Museum's Liverpool version, cast by E. Snell, is thought to be a descendant of that mask. For some people believe that Dr. Antomarchy lived in Cuba for a short period of time and contracted yellow fever. While there he lived on his cousin's coffee plantation and became close to General Juan de Moya, Before Dr. Antomarchy died, he made General Moya a death mask from his mold. It is believed that the mask still resides in the museum in Santiago de Cuba, province of Orient, where there was a large group of French immigrants that established coffee plantations in the high mountains of the Sierra Mestra. Five New Orleans authorities moved their death mask in 1853. During the tumult that accompanied the Civil War, the mask disappeared. A former city treasurer spotted the mask in 1866 as it was being hauled to the dump in a junk wagon. Rather than return the mask to the city, the treasurer took the mask home and put it on display there. Eventually Napoleon's death mask wound up in the Atlanta home of Captain William Green Raoul, president of the Mexican National Railroad. Finally, in 1909, Napoleon's death mask made its way back to New Orleans. Captain Raoul read a newspaper article about the missing mask and wrote to the mayor of its whereabouts. In exchange for suitable acknowledgement, Raoul agreed to donate the death mask to New Orleans. The mayor transferred the mask to the Louisiana State Museum that year. In 1834, Dr. Antomarchy traveled to the United States, visited New Orleans, and presented that city with a bronze copy of the mask. The French doctor also gave a painted plaster copy to a colleague in New Orleans, Dr. Edwin Smith. One, following the death of Dr. Smith, the plaster mask was given to the family of Captain Francis Bryan, a resident of St. Louis, Missouri. In 1894, Bryan donated this mask to his alma mater, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. During its first years in Chapel Hill, Napoleon's plaster face was displayed as a curio on a table in the office of UNC President George T. Winston. The death mask was later transferred to the University Library and ultimately found its way to the library's North Carolina collection. Today, the mask remains in remarkably good condition. The only visible damage to it is a chip above the emperor's upper lip. That damage occurred in 1907, when a janitor at the university overturned the mask while dusting it. 
On the underside of the mask is the handwritten inscription, Dr. Edwin B. Smith's head of NAPN, and presented to Dr. Smith by N. Abs. Fizen. Dr. Ant. Tom Markey. Also written on the bottom of the mask is Tut Darmi, head of the army, reportedly the last words uttered by Napoleon Dr. and Tomarki moved to Cuba in 1838. While there, he lived on his cousin's coffee plantation and became close to General Juan de Moya. Before Dr. and Tomarki died, he made General Moya a death mask from his mold. It is believed that the mask still resides in the museum in Santiago de Cuba, province of Orient, where there were many French immigrants who established coffee plantations in the high mountains of the Sierra Mestra. 5A bronze death mask is in the collection of the Auckland Art Gallery. It was donated by Sir George Gray and is attributed to Antomarchy. 7 Another death mask formerly owned by John Codman Ropes now resides in the lobby of Boston University's Muger Library.